Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Scholar Rock, and Takeda. Hello, I'm Dr. John Bransma. It's a real pleasure to be here today to talk with you about the genetics, epidemiology, and gene testing for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. I'm the neuromuscular section head at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The nomenclature for LGMD was first proposed in 1954, uh, and there was an updated classification put forward in 1995 in the first EMC workshop, where there were two forms identified. There were the ones which are dominantly inherited and the LGMD twos, which are recessively inherited. And this classification system is still used by many, um, but there was a new nomenclature described in 2017 in the second EMC workshop, which also distinguishes based on inheritance pattern and um, allows for more of the genetic underpinnings to be named based on eponyms that many are familiar with. So instead of saying that somebody has LGMD1B, for example, you might call it uh, D2 or dominant 2. Um, and uh, this nomenclature is starting to come into the literature, um, but you may see uh, people referring to either of them when they speak about the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And what we're talking about here are a group of disorders that involve um, interaction of various proteins in the muscle membrane with the extracellular matrix and with the nucleus of the muscle cell as well being involved in some of the disorders. And so you can see many familiar names on this slide if you've dealt with uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Uh, different complexes like the alpha dystroglycan complex, for example, spanning, spanning the uh, muscle membrane and various um, genes that are mutated leading to protein deficiencies that cause the disorder. So here is a list of our dominantly inherited limb girdle syndromes. I'm not gonna go through each one in detail, um, but they are listed for you. And you can see that the collagen six group um, is now referred to as D5, for example, um, whereas ones that were typically called 1A, B, and C are now called by um, what their pathology is, myofibular, MRE trifus, and uh, rippling muscle disease, for example. Here are the recessively inherited limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And you can see under the new nomenclature, these are all referred to as R disorders. Um, and there's a total on the two slides here of um, uh, A through Z in the original nomenclature and now up to R26 in the new updated nomenclature. When we think about trying to make a diagnosis of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, we're going to take the history and physical that comes to us into the clinic and try to narrow our differential because you can imagine that with having this very long list of potential limb girdle pattern muscular dystrophies, you're already dealing with a, a, a wide differential diagnosis, even if you're convinced the person has limb girdle muscular dystrophy in the first place, let alone the other differential for similar symptoms such as exercise intolerance or weakness or high creatine kinase level that might bring somebody into the neuromuscular clinic. And so you can think about the distribution of the weakness. Proximal is the most common. So limb girdle is called that for a reason. It's either shoulder or hip girdle weakness that's usually the most prominent. But if there's a scapuloperineal predominance or a distal predominance of the weakness, that changes your thinking in terms of involved genes. Um, when did the patient start having symptoms? How rapidly progressive are they? That might help you with the differential. Um, thinking about the family, are there other affected individuals? Are there people who may have pure cardiac involvement or a susceptibility to anesthetic reactions without ever having experienced limb weakness? The pattern of um, 
uh, hyperextensibility versus contracture in the joints is sometimes helpful in some forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy to narrow the phenotype down. And also which muscles are atrophied versus pseudo hypertrophy of some muscles as can be seen, for example, in the sarcoglycanopathies, which look a lot like Duchenne muscular dystrophy with pseudo hypertrophy of the calf muscles. And then are there other associated symptoms like cardiac, respiratory, or orthopedic issues? Um, sometimes the EMG may help you if you have irritability in the muscle membrane, or certainly if there's myotonia in some of the disorders that really narrows things down quite a bit. And if you get up getting to the point of needing to take a piece of the muscle to make your diagnosis because your genetics aren't um, focused enough based on the initial screening, uh, muscle biopsy features can also be helpful with immunostaining, looking for different proteins being missing from the muscle or pathological features that may be more suggestive of one group versus another. And so you can see some examples of some specific phenotypes on the right side there. I'm not going to read through all of them for you, but um, the point of going through this exercise is that you want to be as focused as possible with the testing that you're doing which we'll get to in a minute in terms of how the genetic approach um, becomes complicated. If you use the wrong test to make your diagnosis in the individual, you can let be led down um, pathways that aren't so helpful in terms of deciding what to do best for your patient and also establishing the diagnosis. So epidemiology wise, the LGMDs are uncommon and cumulatively are felt to be rare. Although there is a concern that there's an underdiagnosis out there in the community. You can imagine, especially in adult onset disorders that some people may have subtle symptoms. And because the phenotype is so broad, there may be people who have as their only manifestation, a little bit of exercise intolerance or some hyperCKemia without any symptoms um, and may never actually end up getting diagnosed even though they are in fact affected affected by these um, particular gene mutations causing an abnormality that may not ever be detected in their lifetime. The most common adult onset muscular dystrophy presenting with a limb girdle pattern is Becker muscular dystrophy. That would be 2.38 to 7.29 per 100,000 in terms of incidence or prevalence rather whereas most of the others are rare. And if you put them all together, um, it's hard to come up with a number, but some have specific numbers in the literature from some populations. So for example, limb girdle 2D and E have a 0.07 per 100,000, whereas 2I is about 0.43. So it's a range around there in the literature. And it varies depending on the ethnic background of the population you're studying, as well as other factors. So here you can see point prevalence by country of a wide variety of countries around the world of various of the recessive um, limb girdles. And you can see that the range is quite variable. Um, even within the same country between different studies, you can see um, differences in the prevalence um, reported. And this is from one review article that you can see um, listed at the bottom of the slide there. Um, here, again, looking at percent distribution of the subtype per um, uh, uh, country, um, and this is obviously not a comprehensive list of countries, I just took the top part of the table so that it was still visible, um, but you can see that within the same country, again, the variable um, percentages depending on the population that they included, even within the same region. Um, and so um, it's important to take these things with a, a certain amount of grain of salt that there is variability when we do um, population-based studies, but you start to get a sense of the range of relative prevalence. So a few themes to be aware of are that the recessive subtypes are much more common than the dominantly inherited limb girdle um, syndromes. The most common of the um, limb girdles overall is R1 or calpinopathy, which is about 30% of patients, and it's at least twice the prevalence of the next most prevalent subtype. Um, the, the dysphalinopathy range is very wide, depending on where you're um, looking in the literature, anywhere from 5 to 50% of presentations. Um, sarcoglycanopathies are about a third, and then um, dystroglycanopathies also are up there in terms of the most common, especially in Northern Europe, um, such as um, Scandinavia, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Um, the anoctomenopathy subtype, or R12, is frequent in Northern Europe. And um, generally, there's not a gender bias, although R12 is more common among males in population studies. 
Um, and as I was mentioning, this issue of underdiagnosis is a real one. So they've used Bayesian analysis to try to determine um, an estimated prevalence based on some factors that are weighed into that kind of thought process um, related to the um, diagnostic challenges of late onset or more slowly progressive or posse symptomatic disease leading to an undercounting. Um, and then the other LGMD subtypes are generally uncommon, but if you go to specific areas, maybe more more common, for example, R7 in Taiwan. Why do we want to establish a diagnosis? Well, there's many reasons. Firstly, it provides the person affected and their family with closure related to the symptoms that they're experiencing and gives them an answer, quote unquote, in terms of what's going on. Um, but we really want to also be very thoughtful with our genetic counseling at when we make a diagnosis because others in the family may be at risk for being affected if they're a carrier of um, the same mutations it may have. Um, implications for them in terms of monitoring, um, and then also recurrence risk for their children or others in the family as well to be aware of their genetic risk. Um, we also want to think about optimizing our, st our standard of care for the person who is affected. Um, what do we need to watch for? And some forms of limb girdle, for example, are known to have significant heart involvement and others never have heart involvement. And so you don't wanna be asking somebody to get surveillance echocardiograms and EKGs if they're not at any risk of developing a problem, but not getting surveillance of sleep studies, for example, in somebody who might be at risk for nighttime hypoventilation would be a real risk to their overall health and, and experience of the disease if you were to miss being proactive about management of a sleep-related breathing disorder. Um, so uh, this really helps us to tailor our care. And then finally, in this current environment, there's many research trials being done to try to target specific aspects of the pathology of the disease, whether it be genetically targeted treatments or also things um, deemed more at the phenotype, trying to help the muscle or other systems that might be involved. And you can't know that you are eligible for these research trials unless you've actually established a genetic diagnosis. And so it helps to participate in research and bring things forward, both for the person and for the community. So when we're trying to make a diagnosis, um, we can do a single gene test if we're very convinced of the phenotype, which is highly precise. Um, most times what we'll be doing is a genetic panel using next generation technology to look at multiple genes that are associated with a particular phenotype or group of disorders. Um, the challenge with using that is variance of uncertain significance, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, because all of our genes are highly pleiotropic in the muscle space, there's many common spelling differences between people in the population that you may pick up with this way. This becomes even more of an issue when you start broadening to either exome or genome sequencing, because you can imagine the volume of data that you're trying to interpret is much larger and the chance that you're going to get through information that's of uncertain significance is much higher there. And there are some rare situations where a microarray may be helpful if you're dealing with more of a deletion or duplication, which some of these either panel tests or an exome or a genome may miss. You may actually pick somebody up via a microarray. This is also common in the pediatric space when somebody gets microarray done for nonspecific global developmental delay, for example. And some of our disorders do have brain involvement and so may have a microarray done as one of their first tests before even a CK level is checked and be identified as having one of the subtypes of, for example, congenital onset muscular dystrophy, limb girdle muscular dystrophy subtypes related to that. Um, so when we're looking at variants that come through, there's a classification system where usually benign or likely benign variants aren't typically included on the genetic testing report unless it's very suspicious. Um, usually we're in the variant of uncertain significance category where it's felt to do something in terms of either altering the way that the protein structure is um, put together or how it may interact with other proteins that are critical for its function um, that make you suspicious about it. And that becomes likely pathogenic if you you have a presumed model for that. Um, when you have a pathogenic mutation, that means that it's been seen in other people who have the disease previously in other families well described to cause the disorder and you have the same mutation that's known in, in the general um, epidemiology of the global experience of these diseases. And so this will depend on whether you're thinking about a dominant or recessively inherited disease. Uh, in consanguineous families or families where there is a very small population in a region like islands, for example, you may have um, homozygous 
mutations that are very suggestive in a recessively inherited gene um, disorder that might make you convinced that you're dealing with a particular recessive LGMD subtype, for example. And I'd like to thank Brianna Gross, who is our genetic counselor in the CHOP Neuromuscular Clinic um, for some of these slides. Um, so when we're thinking about establishing a limb girdle diagnosis, there's a nice algorithm that was put together in the neurology guidelines for limb girdle care that were published in 2014. Um, you can think about the pattern, the um, inheritance pattern in the family, if there's clues there, and then distinguishing features listed there. Think about your targeted testing. If you get an answer there, you're done. If not, you may need to do a muscle biopsy looking for features that might, again, help you target your genetic testing more to be able to get your answer. Answer. And then if you still don't have one, then you do the more broad testing like genome or exome um, to look for intronic variants or other things that may not be picked up by the initial screening testing. Um, when you're thinking about the conceptual approach, here again is an algorithm that helps you come towards specific genes and subtypes that you may be considering based on the phenotype that you're meeting in the clinic. And that was the dominantly inherited, this is now the recessively inherited um, disorders also with a similar algorithm. And these are finally the X-linked disorders, again, with a similar algorithm in terms of coming to a subtype that might be most likely in terms of establishing your genotype. And so in conclusion, what I hope I've convinced you is that the genotype-phenotype correlation can be complex in the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, and they're quite rare. There's a concern for underdiagnosis in the population, but if you're considering it, you really need to use a clinically focused um, workup based on your own information that you've been able to glean from the assessment of the patient to ensure that you are having a targeted approach to establishing your genetic diagnosis, which will have um, positive implications for the patient as we discussed. Uh, I'm looking forward to the live discussion and the questions afterwards, and thank you very much for your attention. Hello, I'm Dr. John Bransma. Hello again for those of you who were uh, previously listening to the epidemiology part of this talk or for the first time if this is your first time joining this series. Um, uh, I would like to talk now about current and emerging approaches to treatment of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Uh, I'm the neuromuscular section head at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This slide pertains to Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is clearly not our topic for today, but the point that I wanted to bring up related to it is that multidisciplinary care for um, limb girdle muscular dystrophies really is a collaborative approach that requires teamwork and many different stakeholders being involved to ensure that we're optimizing our standard of care. Um, and so the concept that was brought up to me early on in my training was, Multidisciplinary care involves having somebody see the cardiologist and the pulmonologist and the orthopedist and everybody that might be needed for their care, but more in silos usually. Um, whereas the concept of interdisciplinary care, where you actually have a team structure of either a clinic where all those people are present together and are able to interface with each other, or at least at minimum, a very clear communication structure that people can interact and um, give perspectives onto care really helps to optimize outcomes and experience of these disorders. And so we need to ensure that all of the different specialists that may be looking at their particular perspective are also able to take into account the other pieces of the care um, that are being decided upon so that we really can come up with the best plan altogether when there's a care decision to be made in terms of management. So let's go through some systems that are commonly involved and what we might think about in the limb girdle space. Cardiac wise, usually it's a cardiomyopathy that's the issue, most often dilated rather than restrictive, although some disorders are very prone to rhythm disorders, for example, and Marie Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. Um, you can see the subtypes that are associated with cardiac involvement there. Um, and the key piece here is establishing a diagnosis so that if you are known to have a type that is associated with these features, you can have surveillance, whether it be echocardiogram or cardiac MRI for a structural um, 
interrogation, and then also EKG plus or minus Holter monitoring if you're concerned about rhythm-related disorders or other electrical changes. Um, and this allows for proactive initiation of therapy. Often patients will not be symptomatic at the beginning of their experience with the cardiac disease. Uh, and so you can start things like um, cardioprotective medications with ACE inhibitors or whatever else. Um, ahead of time, also with the rhythm side, you want to be sure that you're thinking about putting a pacemaker in place if somebody is at risk of severe dysrhythmias, um, because that can be life-threatening. GI-wise, um, dysphagia is common in many of the disorders and difficulty self-feeding can result, which obviously being underweight is very detrimental to overall health status. You want to uh, help give people supplementation for their feeding if necessary, if that's going on. Um, constipation is another very common issue with smooth muscle dysfunction and also those who are seated full-time or supine um, may not have as good GI transit and um, uh, people can also be prone to gastroesophageal reflux due to similar motility issues. And so treating all these things is very important symptomatically to ensure that you don't get into complications related to these uh, concerns like an aspiration pneumonia, for example. Transitioning then to pulmonary care, um, thinking again about who's at risk so that you can do surveillance. And usually um, we start with pulmonary function tests regularly and look for trends over time. In the pediatric space, it's very difficult to get a pulmonary function test before about six years of age. So that's usually the first time that we can um, start that surveillance. Otherwise, we're looking at either clinical monitoring or other biomarker techniques like maybe um, chest wall movement or other things to try to decide if someone's at risk. Um, and nighttime hyperventilation is usually the first symptom in progressive respiratory weakness. So it's sometimes symptoms like morning headache or feeling um, non-rested, having daytime somnolence that may be the first signs that somebody needs some pressure support at nighttime. Non-invasive ventilation improves quality of life significantly for those who need it, um, but can also significantly decrease morbidity such as recurrent um, respiratory flares with pneumonia and other things. It's so very important to um, be proactive in management with things like cough assist, clearance regimens, and um, thinking about sick plans also for what to do if somebody gets a viral respiratory infection. Do they escalate their inhaled therapies, their cough assist, et cetera? The orthopedic manifestations of most of these disorders are a big part of the disease. Also, we think about contracture and also spinal involvement um, in terms of scoliosis or kyphosis or rigid spine. Um, all of these things can interfere functionally with optimal function and also with activities of daily living and with gait. Um, and pulmonary function can be impacted, especially by scoliosis. Um, so we want to think about bracing and stretching and doing rehabilitation techniques with physical and occupational therapy to reduce discomfort, can preserve mobility and integrity of the joints and um, reduce pulmonary complications. And being vigilant about this is important because living a life with um, muscular dystrophy means that you're even more prone to all of the orthopedic issues that come up in later life for all of us, even with healthy bodies in terms of joint pains and um, other issues that are really a burden to quality of life and can be avoided or minimized if we stay vigilant about not changing the physics of movement and of day-to-day -day function through an avoidable orthopedic complication. Some patients may require actual interventions for their spine. When we think about uh, bone health, um, we think about osteoporosis as a significant issue. Um, there is not a current guideline to routinely um, do surveillance of DEXA or um, uh, so maybe a, like a lateral spinal x-ray, for example, in these disorders, uh, looking for compression fracture. Um, this has um, come out now in the Duchenne literature, for example, as being of use. And so it may be that it starts to be something that we think about doing more routinely for people who are at risk because identifying things like compression fracture that may be asymptomatic or a low bone density by DEXA allows for intervention with um, uh, bisphosphonates and other bone repletion therapies, for example, um, which may reduce the risk that such things um, bring up in terms of injury. So you can imagine those who are diff having difficulties with their mobility are more prone to falls or to um, injuries of um, the body through accidents um, are going to have a significant impact on their quality of life if they progress to fracture, of course. And then there's the disuse atrophy that can happen after a fracture. So we want to be as preventive as possible with these concerns. 
In terms of infection prophylaxis, um, influenza and pneumococcal vaccination um, on a regular schedule are recommended. And also in the current age, um, COVID vaccination and boosting would also be highly recommended for anybody affected by muscular dystrophy. And then we spoke a little bit already about rehabilitation in terms of bracing and stretching. Um, physical and occupational therapy are usually required um, either um, regularly if that's available to the patient um, or in short bursts in terms of training for adults who can then learn what to do on their own, whether it be in a gym or in an exercise program that they enjoy um, to maintain the um, flexibility and um, optimal function of their body. But you have to stay within a a uh, range that you can tolerate in terms of exercise. You don't want to over push it because damaging a dystrophic muscle can be detrimental in the long term. Uh, it used to be kind of frowned upon to do what we call um, eccentric exercise or weightlifting, where we're actually slowly releasing a contraction that we do, which is what most bodybuilders do to build their muscle, because that's felt to be damaging to muscles over time with muscular dystrophy. But more recent studies have shown that um, focused training, where you stay within a range that's tolerated in terms of persistent symptoms afterwards is actually of benefit to individuals um, in the recent literature. It's becoming more and more clear that a targeted exercise program is uh, of therapeutic benefit in uh, muscular dystrophies. Not everybody will require speech therapy, um, but if there's issues either with communication, with clarity of speech, if there's bulbar weakness, and then also swallowing dysfunction can be addressed with speech therapy as well. So when we think about targeted therapies for these disorders, there's really a paucity of targeted therapies currently, although there's a lot coming on the, on the horizon in terms of what we might be able to do for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, and uh, what we do for everybody is best supportive care with interdisciplinary management with all of these systems involved, as I mentioned. Um, corticosteroids may have a role in some subtypes of muscular dystrophy, but there's mixed results in the literature for most of them. Um, the ones that are most clear are FKRP or fucatin related protein muscular dystrophy um, have flares sometimes of what's almost like a rhabdomyolysis or my myositis type picture where they'll have acute muscle pain and weakness and um, this will be transient um, but there does seem to be a response to steroids in those populations and there is also some literature about being on a standing steroid dose whether it be either daily or an alternative schedule such as weekend only dosing actually reducing the frequency of those those myositis type flares in FKRP. And then another group that is often um, used uh, with corticosteroids are the sarcoglycanopathies because of their similarity to um, the dystrophinopathy spectrum. They are quite reminiscent of Duchenne or Becker patients in terms of their presentation. And so some will choose to use corticosteroids in that group as well. And there are some studies looking to objectively show whether or not this is of benefit relative to the, of course, significant side effect burden that comes with corticosteroids also. Gene transfer therapy is a very active area right now. We'll talk about that in a little bit and also gene editing. Um, whereas um, transplantation of stem cells or myoblasts um, is something that is still um, actively being studied. Um, there are some targeted trials going on, for example, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy with this approach. And then um, myostatin inhibition has been somewhat disappointing as a therapeutic modality in most of the trials that it's been trialed uh, in, um, but um, it continues to be an active area of investigation investigation. Um, so here you can see some products in clinical development from a review listed at the bottom of the slide, um, targeting various aspects of um, the um, muscular dystrophies. And you can see the um, subtypes that are being uh, targeted in the active indications there, um, the mechanism of action, and also how they're delivered, some being oral versus intramuscular or intravenous, um, and how they've been um, designated in terms of their regulatory. So actively recruiting trials in the United States currently include um, some gene transfer approaches and also Ribitol um, as a target for limb girdle muscular dystrophy, particularly the um, FK KRP subtype, um, there's a trial um, starting up related to that. And then uh, remeparide, which is a sodium hydrogen exchanger inhibitor, is also being looked at across various um, subtypes there. 
Um, here you have um, some others with a similar um, organization of information. So the more alone is a steroid alternative, um, corticosteroid. Um, we tend to use either prednisone or deflazacord in our um, management of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example. And for more alone uh, is felt to have a different side effect profile that may be more tolerable with a similar efficacy. And so it's gone quite far along in Duchenne work where it's now um, being put towards the FDA for a label at the current time. Um, and there may be um, utility in Becker muscular dystrophy that is being actively studied as well as other forms of limb girdle for this compound. Um, then you can see a couple of other um, uh, gene approaches there. Uh, listed on the slide, and also um, a peptide that is an angiotensin II receptor modulator that's going to be studied subcutaneously. Um, here are some uh, uh, trials that are listed by their phase in terms of phase one through three, um, with three being the um, placebo controlled level of evidence um, that often leads to approval, although some approvals may come based on phase two level data if the evidence is strong. Um, and you can see that these are mostly looking at established therapies like prednisone or deflazacort in certain populations to see um, if they are effective. Um, and also some gene-based approaches. So when we're thinking about gene transfer in this space, it's been a very exciting area in terms of um, the early efficacy results that have been shared. And there are even some publications related to either intramuscular injection for the sarcoglycanopathies, for example, that you might review in the literature. Um, but what's also become clear is that safety is a significant issue in the gene therapy space. And of course, this is well known to anybody that's uh, familiar with it based on the initial stuttering start of gene transfer work in the 1990s based on some safety events there that um, did lead to a, a general pause in, in activity in the area for you know, several decades before we were able to get back on track with um, having some of these um, uh, approaches now, not just in the research trial space, but actually in the clinic, for example, in the neuromuscular space with uh, an Senna gene Abaparvovec for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, so you can see on this slide that the myotubular myopathy space, for example, in congenital myopathy was really um, showing some significant efficacy um, uh, positive results. And then there were multiple deaths in that protocol felt to be related to an underlying vulnerability in the liver related to peliosis in that disease um, that have led to a, an eventual hold now at this point where there's no further patients being dosed until this can get, be better sorted out on a preclinical basis. Um, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy micro or mini dystrophin trials are actively um, uh, dosing in, in 2021 and 22 at the time of this current recording. Um, and there was a late 2021 death in the program um, for Duchenne in a non-ambulatory participant that was felt to be related to a cardiac um, reaction in the early um, days after treatment um, that's still being um, sorted out in terms of exactly what happened at this time. Um, but it's just another list lesson about how we learn about the potential complications of these therapies sometimes in the clinical space because there was really no preclinical precedent um, for this issue coming up. And um, so what we've seen is um, thrombotic microangiopathy as a complement mediated reaction in the early phase. And then as the adaptive immune system gets involved at kind of the month to six week mark after dosing will often have issues with hepatopathy or a myositis phenotype has come through, even a myocarditis or a rhabdomyolysis um, uh, issue has come up in a few of the protocols, for example. And um, so we really have to be vigilant for these things. Um, use of steroids has mitigated this to an extent around the time of dosing, um, but we may eventually get to the point where other immune modulation is also standard in some approaches, depending maybe on the genotype of the person and also um, what we know as potential risks in certain types of morbidity related to the phenotype of the disease um, uh, to best surveil of for getting people through this treatment as effectively as possible if it's felt to be dur durable and efficacious. And gene editing will be even more complicated as it comes through with CRISPR-Cas9 technology um, because that not only involves targeting a specific um, spliceosome to the person's individual mutation. And you can imagine that with the heterogeneity of limb girdle, this is going to involve a lot of different types of CRISPR-Cas9, but it's also delivered via viral vector technology. And so we have all the same issues as we might come up with, with the initial reactions like complement and other things that we see with the gene transfer. So um, I hope that in these uh, 
uh, short minutes, I've been able to convince you that interdisciplinary care is really the key uh, the, uh, to uh, the optimal experience of these disorders in terms of function and outcome in limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and that currently our management is primarily supportive, and that we need to think about the various systems that we need to both surveil in terms of potential involvement and also be proactive about the management. But targeted treatments are actively in research trial and on the horizon and may already be used in your clinic if you are somebody who uses corticosteroids for some of the subtypes, for example. And so we're going to have a very active um, research landscape in this space for many years to come. And the key again is establishing a diagnosis so that you can tailor precision medicine to the individual and make sure that they're being intervened on with the right agents at the right time in their life to have the best possible experience of the disease. Thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to the question and answer session. Hi, my name is Diana Castro. I'm a pediatric neuromuscular physician in Dallas, Texas, and today we'll talk about strategies to expedite diagnosis in Duchenne muscular dystrophy from symptoms to the gene testing. Let's start with saying that most of the patients with motor delays are first identified by their family members and first evaluated by primary care physicians, pediatricians most of the time. For this reason, the American Academy of Pediatrics created an algorithm in 2013 to help guiding the diagnosis and to help making this diagnosis earlier. The step one, what is was recommended is that motor development should be evaluated in every single visit, like the well visit for the child. But also they recommended that at different ages, including nine, 18, 30, and 48 months, there should be a screening tool applied to the child. Why? Because those are critical times of development in the motor, um, the motor milestones. Then after that, if there is a recognition of any delay, they recommend uh, more in-depth family history, and they recommend also a physical examination. And hopefully at that point, that's the point where we wanna get a creatinine kinase and move on with the process if we're talking about a boy. So let's just talk about the specifics. And I know many of you will know, but just to remind that at nine months, that's the limit for a kid to be able to roll to both sides. They should be able to sit well without support and they should be able to have a good grasp and transfer objects. 18 months of visit, they should be able to sit and stand and walk independently. As a pediatric neurologist, usually I get that question, what is the limit for them to start walking? And I always say 18 months. If the patient is not walking by 18 months, it is important to start an evaluation right away. At 30 months, most of the delays have been identified, and that's the time that maybe we will even start seeing some regress in some of those milestones. And at 48 months, then you have a higher level of milestones, including early elementary school skills. They will have more fine motor handwriting, gross motor communication, feeding abilities that will be developed or fully developed at that time. If the patient has, again, lost any of those skills, that should be an alert for that physician to start doing a more specific workup. These are just the same, just showing the different milestones at different ages. So as I said at the beginning, every development should be evaluated at every single visit, but there are some specific visits included in 9, 18, 30, and 48 months where the patient should have uh, or should undergo a specific screening to try to see if there are some developmental disorders. And at every visit, it's so important for to ask for family history. We know many times the families will not tell us right away. We have to be very specific. And one of the questions I ask, is there anybody in your family who has to get a, a wheelchair early in life or a cane or a walker, things like that? Those specific questions will help us getting a more clear family history. And again, this is part of what I was, asked, I was just telling you, there are also specific questions that can help us. So is there anything that your child is not doing that you think that, that your child should be doing? Is there anything, any difference between your child and other kids? Was your child able to do something and now no longer can do it? So all of those questions are key to identify patients with motor delays. 
So now we have identified that patient, or let's say the caregiver identified those symptoms, the pediatrician has identified those symptoms, the first thing that they should do is a creatinine kinase. And obviously we'll get the, to the uh, physical examination. In Duchenne, we divide the symptoms in two groups, the group of the motor symptoms and the non-motor symptoms. The non-motor are because one third of the patients with Duchenne will actually present with more behavioral issues, cognitive delays, autistic behavior. They will have learning and attention disorders, a speech delay. So again, one third of those patients can be one of those first symptoms that you're seeing between two to five years of age. And then in terms of the motor development or the motor symptoms, what we're going to see is gross motor delay, loss of motor skills in some cases, abnormal gait. The first abnormality in gait is usually toe walking. Frequent falling, clums, clumsiness, they describe as my child is clumsy, my child is not able to jump or able to run, or they are just falling behind their peers. They may develop uh, decreased endurance, difficulty climbing stairs, and muscle pain and cramping. We can see it a little bit later. So what do we look at during the physical examination? We divided in terms of the general examination, what you're looking mainly are for areas of tightness in some of the joints. And the most likely, the first place that you're gonna see are gonna be the ankles. That's why the patient will develop toe walking first. But you can see down the road, you can see contractures in the ankles, in the knees, the hip, the elbows, and so on. They can have pseudo hypertrophy. That's where the muscle is replaced by fat. So the muscle will look bigger in size, including in the calf, the temporal muscles in the head, that that's something that sometimes it's not identified right away, and also paraspinal muscles. The patient may have a large tongue, macroglossia, and if the patient, at the time the patient loses ambulation, they can develop a scoliosis, something that we don't see as frequent because of the use of steroids. During the neuromuscular examination, what we're looking is for hypotonia. And in general, we see patients that have generalized hypotonia, but you could also have hypotonia that is more localized to the neck and the trunk or the extremities. If you have a small child, when you try to pick him up from the bed, there is decreased head control in pretty much all of them. It's one of the first muscles that gets weak. The weakness will develop progressively from the proximal muscle to the distal muscles and from the legs, then down the road to the arms as well. The patients may have something called transverse smile. That is when they try to smile, you see most like a line because they have facial weakness. They can have decreased deep tendon reflex or absent reflexes. The positive gout that everybody knows to walking and water and gait. Let me show you a video of the typical gout. And this is one of my patients who um, at that point he was around five years of age. And that was one of the first thing that mom identified as abnormal. So when he tries to stand up, he's gonna use his hands to climb up all the way up to uh, his hip and being able to stand up. So you see, and that is a typical gower. Gower can be seen in other conditions, but if you see it in a boy between two to five years of age, you most likely have a diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And again, the first step should be getting a creatinine kinase. And the picture next to that video, it's one of my patients with severe pseudo hypertrophy of the calf. So you see that calf extremely enlarged. And unfortunately with time, they continue growing. And here I'm gonna show you two patterns of gait. Uh, this is one of the typical gait that we call it like waddling gait. So he's having to use other muscles to try to run. That was him trying to run. And then here I have a younger patient. He's from a family of three kids with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And he's the youngest where you start seeing already some of the pattern. He has some toe walking. He has some uh, exaggerated lordosis. Um, and then progressively, you will start seeing the more clear pattern like the child next to it. So just to say, again, this is just a paper that I found with this mnemotechnic to help um, you know, physicians recognizing Duchenne. Always think about muscle, 
M for motor mileage delay, I'm sorry, U for initial gait, we talk about the toe walking or the um, waddling gait, S for speech delay, because we said that some of them, one third of them may have uh, those non-motor symptoms, CK as soon as possible, L leads to early diagnosis of Duchenne. Again, all of these uh, symptoms are should be recognized in these kids as fast as possible. Why? Because we have different treatments today and we have different options for these kids. So now we have a patient that we identify as a patient with motor delays. The physical exam uh, is telling us that very likely is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You get a CK level, which is usually 10 to 100 times higher of the normal level. So the next step is checking for genetics. The dystrophin gene is one of the largest known human gene and contains 79 exons. It is localized in the X chromosome. For this reason, moms are carriers and usually the affected is a boy. So it's an X-linked recessive disease. One out of three cases are caused by de novo mutations. And this is very important to remember because many families, they say, but nobody in my family has had this type of condition. Yes, it can happen. It's also important that understanding that most of the dystrophin gene abnormalities that cause Duchenne muscular dystrophy are what we call deletions. It's around 68% of the patients that will have some kind of deletion, so they are missing one of the exons. Some of the patients will have duplications in around 11% of those patients, and it means that you have extra information that is not allowing the normal protein to form. And then the rest of the patients will have what we call mutations. And again, just to, to remind uh, or to let you know a little bit about the, the reason why it's so important, this dystrophin protein is extremely important because it is pretty much what it holds the membrane in place. It has connections with proteins inside the cell and outside the cell, and it really serves as a shock absorbent during muscle fiber contraction. So here are some just examples of different um, deletions, mutations that we can see. On the first box, you see that's a normal patient. So you have the patient start the translation of the protein from number one to exon 79, protein is normal. In case of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the problem is that the protein will be disrupted earlier. So the protein is not going to be able to form, the patient will have no levels of dystrophin or extremely, extremely low levels of dystrophin. In the two examples, the example above shows you a deletion of exon 47 to 50, which causes disruption of the reading frame and causes the protein to stop prematurely. And on the second example, what we call nonsense mutations, in these cases, what happens is that there is a change of an amino acid and there is a, the formation of a stop cotton, which also it's gonna stop the protein from forming. On the one below, this is a patient with Becker muscular dystrophy that I did not mention before. Becker muscular dystrophy is identified later in life, usually because these patients will have symptoms when they are 15, 16 years of age, sometime a little younger. But the difference is that even though there is a deletion, for example, in this, a patient, patient has a deletion of 46 to 54, the patient has the open reading frame is still maintained and they will continue forming protein. The difference is that it's gonna be a short protein. So the difference between Duchenne and Becker's is the amount of protein that is present. So no protein in Duchenne or extremely, extremely low levels and um, a short protein in Becker muscular dystrophy. So how do we do the testing? The way we, we do testing in general is called MLPA. It's multiplex ligation dependent prof amplification. And we order it as first look for deletions. Why? Because again, we say around 70% of patients have a deletion. If the deletion is not identified, then what they do is called sequencing to try to find if there's a specific point mutation or something very small that was not seen as a deletion. If the patient has it, then you have a diagnosis of the shit. But if you don't find a mutation, then you have to start looking more into a muscle biopsy. 
We don't do muscle biopsies these days. It's very rare that we do. And this is one of those cases where we know that the clinical picture is telling us that it's a shen, but the genetic testing for both the lesion and um, sequencing are normal. Then we have to do a muscle biopsy and look at the dystrophin levels in the muscle. And why is important genetic diagnosis? Because we have a standard of care. We have a specific ways to take care of this patient. And that's why the mortality uh, of these patients have moved from now in the past being around 15 years of age to now being in the 30s or 40s. It also helps for family planning. There are also mutation specific therapies that are approved and some even on, on research right now. So we could try to get one of those patients in a specific research. And it's also important because of the mothers, because the mothers that are carrier may develop heart disease later in their 40s or 50s. So it's important for them to start having care. Then I wanna tell you about two studies really quick to make the point that we're not doing a good job still identifying these patients early. This first study talks about uh, the time for diagnosis uh, and this study from, was from this year, 2022. What they did is that they identified 221 boys with definite or probable Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, without documented family history, because if you have family history, obviously you're gonna get diagnosed earlier. This was between 2000 to 2015, and this information was collected in these different sites. What they found is that the family or the primary caregivers are obviously the first person that identify the concerns. And then the initial medical evaluation is performed by the pediatrician, like we said at the beginning. After that, the pediatrician will refer to neurologists and likely a patient is gonna end up with a neuromuscular specialist. The mean age at first signs and symptoms reported by the caregiver was 2.7. Usually symptoms will be evident between two to five years of age. The first CK unfortunately was obtained until 4.6 years. So you had this huge gap from the time the family member knows something is wrong to the time the physician is just getting a CK level. The DNA muscle biopsy confirmatory testing, 4.9 years, because once you have an elevated CK, you know this is gonna be Duchenne. The average time from first symptoms to diagnosis confirmation, it's unfortunately 2.2 years. And all of these variants are even worse in populations like African-American and Hispanic patients. This is a second study just to show, again, the same point. We're not doing a good job diagnosing these patients early, but they're also different in uh, ethnicities. This study reviewed 540 records for patients, and they collected the, the information of 375 of those. What they look was different outcomes, including the age at initial evaluation, initial CK level, and initial DNA testing, and also look at different socio-demographic variables or socioeconomic variables for these patients. So what they found is that 66% of these patients did not have a family history of Duchenne muscular dystrophy or Becker muscular dystrophy. 70% of them were white, 30% of them were or Hispanic or um, African-American. The black and Hispanic race slash ethnicity predicted older ages at initial evaluation. They also predicted older age for obtaining a creatinine kinase and for getting DNA testing. The positive family history, obviously, like we have said before, predicted a younger age of diagnosis and a younger age to get a CK level and DNA testing. And it was very interesting to me that actually the higher neighborhood poverty was associated with earlier diagnosis for patients with Duchenne. And the explanation of that is that they think because those neighborhoods are so poor, they may have more social services available that monitor the child development uh, more closely in these populations. So what we learned about all of these was that it is very important to evaluate motor milestones in every visit, but definitely extremely important in the visits at months 9, 18, 30, and 48 months, because those are critical for motor development. The early symptoms in Duchenne can include motor and non-motor, 
symptoms, usually between two to five years of age. If there is any concern about motor development, a creatinine kinase should be obtained, and it will be found to be elevated between 10 to 100 times the normal level. And the patient right away should be referred to a neurologist or a neuromuscular physician. The DMD genetic testing can be obtained through free sponsor programs. And I did not mention this before, but it's important to know that uh, this is not something that the family has to pay for. And genetic testing is important because we have a standard of care that are gonna improve the quality of life for that child. It will help with family planning, mutation specific treatments, which could be approved or in research, and also for care of the mothers, which can develop, who can develop uh, cardiomyopathy or heart disease after their 40s. Thank you so much. Welcome to this presentation entitled um, Current and Emerging Therapies in Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. My name is Emma Cefaloni. I'm a professor of neurology and pediatrics at the University of Rochester. As many of you know, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most common dystrophy in uh, childhood. Is it caused by um, uh, gene mutation, uh, several different types of mutation in the DMD gene, which is a very large uh, gene. Uh, and uh, mutation in the DMD gene cause absence or reduced dystrophin protein and uh, subsequent muscle fiber instability. It's important as we talk about emerging strategies, therapeutic strategies to understand the open reading frame theory, which tell us that out of frame mutation that disrupt the reading frame in the gene cause absence of dystrophin and a severe Duchenne phenotype, while in frame mutations that preserve the reading frame cause reduced but partially functional dystrophin and a milder phenotype, um, usually referred as a Becker muscular dystrophy. And dystrophin really plays a crucial role in maintaining the structural integrity of the muscle or cell membrane by connecting the cytoskeleton to the surrounding extracellular matrix, as you can see here on the right inside panel. And therefore, lack of dystrophin results in muscle fiber breakdown, um, um, abnormal calcium influx, inflammation, necrosis, and the uh, progressive irreversible replace, replacement of um, muscle tissue with fibrotic tissue and fat, which um, in turn leads to severe muscle wasting and, and weakness. The natural history of Duchenne is well described with signs and symptoms always starting before age five. Loss of ambulation is always be before age 12. And after that, there is a series of comorbidity that settle in, such as osteoporosis, um, fractures, uh, joint contracture, progressive scoliosis, and most importantly, cardiomyopathy and respiratory failure that eventually lead to um, severe morbidity and early mortality. And so the mean age of death in the old natural history of Duchenne in different series was really um, in the late um, teenager years. And so traditionally, Duchenne was not um, uh, an adult disease. Now, a multidisciplinary uh, preemptive um, approach with standard of care that's really centered on a very early uh, genetically confirmed diagnosis early intervention with long-term um, glucocorticoid treatment and with very proactive monitoring and intervention for um, cardiac and pulmonary function, as well as orthopedic, endocrine, physical therapy has really shown to um, improve significantly the quality of life, uh, morbidity, and most importantly, survival in the disease, even in uh, before um, what we're going to discuss in a bit more disease modifying um, uh, treatment. And it's really important that probably the pulmonary care is what has driven uh, the much improved survival. And it's important to remember that the very first thing to um, that becomes affected in Duchenne is really a weak cough. So measuring very uh, consistently peak cough flow 
and intervening with the cough machine as soon as that uh, peak cough flow goes be so be below a certain limit is very important. That is eventually followed by nocturnal hypoventilation that can be monitored and assessed uh, with polysomnogram and then intervene with uh, nocturnal BiPAP. And then eventually uh, later um, hypoventilation during the day that will require intervention with the more permanent uh, either non-invasive or invasive ventilation. And this really proactive approach of pulmonary care has really driven survival um, to improve um, significantly. And the other cardinal feature of standard of care for Duchenne that really has changed the natural history of the disease has been the long-term therapy with glucocorticoid uh, that is now um, universally considered standard of care and is proven to slow the disease progression. Uh, daily prednisone um, or daily deflazacor in the doses that are described here in these slides have been now proved um, through several uh, studies and trials, as well as uh, long-term uh, prospective cohorts to delay loss of ambulation by two to five years. Um, they preserve uh, upper limb function, reduce uh, need for uh, scoliosis surgery, and also uh, delay um, uh, cardiomyopathy and respiratory insufficiency, so improve cardiopulmonary function and overall increase survival well into the third and even four decades. So now with the new natural history and with this type of um, standard of care, the disease really transitioned to young uh, adult uh, for the majority. And of course, um, it's important to remember that with the chronic uh, therapy of corticosteroids, it's very, very important to manage the well-known side effects, the most important of which are weight gain, behavioral uh, side effects, uh, short stature, bone fragility, and hirsutism, Cushinoid uh, syndrome. So um, the management uh, goes in parallel with the, with the treatment. So there are limitations still um, in the field um, with a still persistent diagnostic delay of about two and a half years. This has been demonstrated across different countries and is persistent in the past two decades, has not changed. So a mean age of diagnosis at um, age five. So there is a delay there. Um, the use of corticosteroids, although overall um, uniformly improved overall in the past decades, um, is still uh, not uniform in, in the sense that um, many different regimens are used in different clinics and, and different settings. The best age to start corticosteroids is still kind of an undecided. And although uh, the field agrees that probably uh, four years of age, we don't know earlier um, when will be um, doable, and there are ongoing study to really study corticosteroids in, in the very young uh, prior to age three. And then obviously um, some difficulty with transition of care uh, from a pediatric onset disease to adult providers that might not be as familiar with the childhood onset um, rare disease. So that's the, the new natural history and the standard of care that is well um, recognized for Duchenne. But in the past 10 years, there has been very exciting uh, new approaches and emerging therapies uh, with the more disease-modifying mechanism of action. And I think it, it, it makes sense to divide it in two major groups. One are those new treatments that are really targeting dystrophin restoration through gene replacement or gene editing. So um, really going to the uh, root uh, of the disease pathology. Some of these compounds apply to the majority of uh, genotypes and the majority of patients with Duchenne. Others are really very mutation specific and we'll discuss that. So we have gene therapy, exon skipping, stop codon read-through and CRISPR. And then there is a second um, group that really targets more of a downstream um, pathogenesis and um, these treatment act on molecular pathways of the pathophysiology of Duchenne downstream of the absence of functional dystrophin, like we discussed, you know, these are anti-inflammatory, antifibrotic, 
or generally uh, drugs that are targeting improvement in muscle growth and protection. So um, I just want to um, say a couple of words about clinical trials in Duchenne. We cannot um, forget that Duchenne is an ultra rare disease in the big picture. So there are challenges with the design and carry on of clinical trials. Uh, biomarkers uh, right now are limited to dystrophin expression, and even there, uh, the field is still not 100% uniform in, in uh, what is a minimum amount of dystrophin sufficient to um, modify the disease course. Muscle MRI is emerging as a very promising uh, biomarker, and, and, and CKs are still used. And clinical endpoints really focus on motor scales, such as the North Star, the six minutes walk test, four step ascent. So these are different primary outcomes using the different trials. Um, but there is definitely a need for novel, clinically meaningful endpoints and, and certainly quality of life assessment. So we're going to start with some of the genetic modifying treatment. Exon skipping um, is a strategy that really acts on pre-messenger RNA to modulate splicing of out-of-frame mutation and to restore the open reading frame and therefore produce an internally uh, truncated but functional dystrophin. These are antisense oligonucleotide. Um, they usually target um, specific groups of mutation, especially in the hot spots of the of the gene. And it, uh, important to remember that these um, have now uh, reached uh, the commercial use. There are now four such exon skipping drugs that are um, that have received approval. Um, this was done through accelerated approval pathways, which means uh, they were approved on a surrogate endpoint of dystrophin production. But there is now more and more accumulating um, growing body of evidence confirming also uh, a translation positive treatment effect that is clinical um, improvement as well, and overall favorable uh, safety profile, slowing disease progressions uh, when compared to the, to the natural history. And it's very promising also that beside the one that have already been approved, there are now uh, a really a large effort to uh, develop next generation uh, peptide conjugated phosphorodiamidate um, morpholinos and uh, other um, ASO conjugated, for example, to antibody fragment that make really the, um, the target effect of these compounds um, much more potent than in the ones in the first uh, generation. And these are the four currently approved, commercially available. Um, each of these are really targeting and indicated only for a very uh, su a specific subgroup of mutation, for example, etaplirsin. Uh, skipping of exon 51 address really approximately 14% of patients with Duchenne. Um, Tazimersin induced skipping of exon 45, that's about 9%. And um, the two other approved, Golodirsin and Viltolarsin, induced skipping of exon 53, which is really applicable to about 10% of patients with Duchenne. These are drugs that are delivered uh, through an IV infusion um, once a week and generally have been shown to be well tolerated um, and renal function and platelets needs to be uh, monitored um, regularly because of the potential um, side effects. And there are there have been studies in clinical trials and they're used and recommended in combination with corticosteroids and, and, um, and standard of care. Ethylurin, um, it's a small molecule that is given orally and it promotes ribosome read-through of premature stop codon. So um, stop codons uh, account for about 13% of um, abnormal mutations. So 13% of patients with Duchenne are candidate for this drug, which interestingly was approved by the EMA, but is not currently approved um, by the FDA. Um, generally well tolerated in clinical trials um, and in open extended studies so far with minor uh, mild to moderate side effects of vomiting, diarrhea, 
one of the most exciting and expected uh, potential disease modifying treatment, and not just for Duchenne, but for many and neuromuscular disease is now gene therapy, which really uses um, adeno-associated viruses as um, vectors um, to deliver uh, gene therapy. And these are particularly interesting vectors because they're known uh, pathogenic in human, and they're mostly known integrating viruses. Um, the downside is that they cannot accommodate a full-length dystrophin gene because of the uh, very large size of the dystrophin gene. And therefore, different programs currently in human development are actually using uh, micro or mini dystrophin. There are three such programs that have now advanced into uh, phase two and three uh, human studies. Two of these um, use AAV9, and a third program actually use an AAV RH74, and they're in different stage of uh, clinical trials. Obviously, this um, uh, type of approach is open to the majority of tuition patients, regardless of their mutation. The only preclusion is uh, pre-existent immunity, so positive AAV uh, antibodies in the case um, those patients cannot receive such treatment. And then there are a few um, specific mutations that are capable to trigger a T-cell-mediated immune response um, to the transgene, and therefore they are excluded uh, because of safety reasons. And so here is um, an example of a proof of concept for such a gene uh, therapy of microdystrophin. This uh, was uh, first uh, four um, Duchenne children between the age of four and six that were infused with the one-time IV infusion with the AAVRH74. And here in these panels, you can see at 90 days uh, biopsy post-treatment, um, uh, the, the, the improvement in uh, dystrophin positive uh, muscle fiber, as well as the amount of uh, dystrophin on Western blood, showing that this that the treatment was generally um, safe, no um, serious side effects, and, and a significant uh, expression and uh, correct localization of dystrophin on muscle biopsy. These um, obviously these three programs currently in advanced human clinical trials all have shared their um, safety across trials, which is obviously a, a major focus of, uh, of, of these programs. And so far, generally um, uh, quite safe, but these are listed some of the um, more uh, important side effects with nausea, vomit, and transaminitis, one death due to um, acute cardiomyositis, and one case of immune-mediated myositis. Um, CRISPR has received a lot of attention, not just for, for uh, Duchenne and neuromuscular diseases. Obviously, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy disease has not entered yet human trials, but we hope that in the near future, it will translate into um, human studies. But for now, it has been demonstrated quite effective in the MDX mouse. Um, and also um, in uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and myoblast of um, Duchenne patient with a variety of uh, genetic mutations. So quite a promising uh, potential um, editing um, uh, treatment so far, um, at least in the, in the animal model with no off-target uh, toxicity. Vamorolone is a novel synthetic steroidal drug that has now um, moving forward towards a potential very early uh, FDA approval based on initial uh, several clinical trials that have shown basically um, an effectiveness on motor outcome very similar to the corticosteroids, but with a um, um, a demonstrated uh, um, less uh, serious side effects, especially on growth and BMI. So quite an appealing uh, potential uh, alternative to the more traditional corticosteroids because of a more, ben uh, more benign side effects uh, profiles. Givinostat has also just recently showed uh, top line results. Um, it is a, a, a inhibitor um, 
that increases expression of folistatin via epigenetic control um, and um, reduce uh, fibrosis in muscle tissue and has uh, shown preclinical data in, in, the, in the mice model. And now in humans, Duchenne um, has um, resulted in their um, significant change in the primary outcome. Um, and um, also by MRI, muscle MRI um, uh, efficacy. Um, and um, uh, pamvrelumab uh, um, needs to be mentioned is a first-in-class monoclonal antibody that inhibits the activity of connective tissue growth factor. So again, as a mechanism of action to um, um, decrease uh, fibrosis, which obviously has an important negative um, uh, factor in, in the progression of Duchenne, and has now entered uh, phase three trials for, for both ambulatory and non-ambulatory patient in Duchenne with preliminary very promising results and, and generally well tolerated with only um, mild side effects that are listed in, in these slides. And um, uh, as a last potential, this is obviously not a totally in inclusive list, but uh, EDG5506 is a potent selective fast skeletal muscle myosin inhibitor. It is uh, known that um, type 2 fast fibers show early degeneration in Duchenne. So this drug um, targets uh, the fast skeletal muscle myosin um, and is now enter um, human clinical trials in both Becker and Duchenne with preliminary uh, promising um, uh, results and showing also decrease in, in biomarkers of muscle damage and overall well tolerated so far. So in conclusion, I think that, uh, that we are expecting um, many new disease modifying treatment uh, reaching commercial phase, awfully. I think that the remaining challenges include there is a great need for an earlier diagnosis because they know, we know that once the fibrosis um, set in, it's, it's very hard to reverse uh, that type of damage. So early diagnosis and newborn screening is under review currently. And the combination therapy most likely will remain um, um, a, a model, at least for the near future. And then to maximize next generation exon skipping with more target efficacy, perhaps less frequent dosing, and then the safety and uh, the challenges of gene therapy um, with uh, pre-existing AAV antibodies and the ability to uh, redose um, 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 down the road. Uh, thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Claudia Chiraboga. I'm a professor of neurology and pediatrics at Columbia University Medical Center in New York. And I'm delighted to be talking to you today about the opportunities and challenges with newborn screening for spinal muscular atrophy. So just a little bit of background. As you know, the spinal muscular atrophy, the 5Q, the SMA that is the target of the clinical trials is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder that preferentially affects motor neurons. It can affect other cells, but motor neurons are exquisitely sensitive to uh, this disorder. It's a very common autosomal recessive neuromuscular disorder with a carrier weight of 1 in 50. Uh, in New York, for example, our pilot study showed 1 in 64, but it can be much lower than that. The wide spectrum of disease uh, with types going from 0 or 1A, which is connatal, to adult onset, which is type 4. And it's caused by a mutation in the SMN1 gene uh, in chromosome 5, hence the 5Q, which causes a reduction in, spinal, uh, in survival motor neuron protein. Uh, SMN2, of which humans carry 1 to 6, modifies the phenotype. Uh, as you can see here, the SMN1 gene transcribes full-length SMN protein, which is the lion's share of the SMN protein in the body, about 90%. There's a second paralogous gene, SMN2, that is similar but differs in that uh, T for C substitution, which results in a truncated delta-7 SMN protein because it is lacking exon-7 and is non-functional. However, there is about a 
that is alternatively spliced to include that functional SMN protein, which is important in SMA where there is no uh, SMN protein derived from the SMN1 and the entirety of the SMN protein in the body is derived from that alternatively spliced SMN protein full length uh, from the alternative splicing. There are three pediatric forms. I won't talk about type zero, which is the connatal type, but just very briefly, type one is the more severe form, presents in early infancy, and um, by definition, they never sit, and they can have a early demise unless there's intervention. SMA type two, the intermediate type, about a quarter of cases, is um, classified by the ability to sit, but they never walk, and they mostly have musculoskeletal uh, problems over time. And type three, which is the ambulatory type, the least common, and uh, their life expectancy is normal. The SMN2 copy number modifies the phenotype because with the higher number of SMN2 copy numbers, the greater the amount of SMN protein, the lower the severity of the disease or milder the phenotype. On the other end of the spectrum, without any SMN2, patients with SMA would not survive. The SMA severity and phenotypes is not absolute with regards to SMN2 copy number. The predominance of SMA type 1s here in the first graph um, in red are two copy numbers. The predominance of SMA type 2 are three copy numbers, and the predominance of SMA type 3 are three and four copy numbers. But as you can see, it's not absolute and there is some overlap. SMA diagnosis and pitfalls. Well, increasingly, um, we are using now quantitative PCR that allows for the identification of carriers as well as patients. And the test uh, is a genetic test of the SMN1 gene and what it identifies is exon 7. And so in this graph, you can see that they're lower but still higher levels of um, SMN1 that is identified. But I bring your attention to the far panel, the far graph, where you can see that green line where there is no transcription. And that is because there's a homozygous deletion of exon 7 that results in SMA. So does that mean that we can identify with this test all patients with SMA? There are false negative tests with SMA because it does not identify all cases. And the reason for that is that about three to 5% of cases can have a point mutation, which will be missed by the test, which will appear as either a carrier, if it's present only in one allele, or sometimes in consanguinity, it can be on two alleles and appear as uh, not even being a carrier. So if you clinically suspect SMA, even if the test is negative, and that includes newborn screening, you need to proceed with um, SMN1 sequencing to identify the point mutations. And these infants who have point mutations increasingly are the symptomatic patients that we are identifying in the era of newborn screening. There are FDA approved SMA treatments and I won't go too much in detail other than to say that all three of these disease modifying therapies are approved for use in newborns. Nusinersen, which is the first one approved for SMA 